And yourself now. Happy yeah. Birthday. Everybody behave. You're on TV. All right. All right, let's do it. I didn't look at the clock on the, the phone, but I, the last couple of Sundays I've been running behind. I, um, got some texts from Danny and Liz this morning. They're, they're on a busload of old people <laughs> driving out to West. They're going to, I think, uh, their first stop is going to be the, oh, they've already made a fun, bunch of first stops. They're headed towards seeing the world's largest ball of twine, I think. <laughs> and uh, they're eating in all the best places where they throw rolls at you and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, let's see here. Uh, get my grits in order. I, I, I started last week using my electronic Bible, and I, I got it. It's in the sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> So I get it really all together. But they, they text us this morning. They've, they've been uh, making some notable stops. And, uh, so they're, uh, they're going to be gone next Sunday as well. Terry told them that they missed them, but I told them I didn't. I didn't <laughs> miss them at all. Just envy them. Uh, the wards went down to the beach before the hurricane hit. That, that was good timing. Pray for those folks down there. Isn't that a mess? My goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it has really tore up Doc. But uh, they've made uh, lots of improvements down there. They've learned a lot of uh, a lot of different ways of building things. I, I heard some of that. They're going back and look at uh, Hurricane Katrina and everything down at that wiped out New Orleans and everything. And... Uh, you know, New Orleans is under sea level there, and, and uh, the only thing protecting them from the ocean is those levees. They've got some big levees, and they're just built out of dirt and mud. And uh, so they've gone back, and they've rebuilt those levees, and I, I think they've re-engineered them. Uh, they said that if those levees had been built properly and had been maintained, you know, when uh, Katrina hit New Orleans, it was only a level one hurricane. And... Uh, so they probably would have had some ankle deep water down the French Quarter, but it wouldn't have killed that many people and put that many people out of homelessness. So it all pretty much boils down to politicians and city managers. Mm -hmm. Lots of money is, you know, you, you, uh, we could say, well, they just didn't have the money to do that. I, I bet you billions of dollars has been flowing through New Orleans for the past 50 years, mm -hmm. ever since it became the Big Easy. And instead of making improvements on the roads, the streets, the sewer lines, the drainage, and the levees, it all went up in smoke if, if the politicians are spending. So, well, this is not a, a gripe session. I, I, I don't have much respect for many politicians, and uh, I'm not of a mind to thinking that we, if, we had a, if we had a whole other bunch that we could put in their place right now, that everything would be fixed. I don't, I don't believe that either. Well... Uh, Eric Harwell began his uh, chemo this week, and uh, Johnny said he was in it for six hours. So they they told him he's a young man, he's stout, he hadn't hadn't eaten much in in a long time. So I imagine he's not as uh, hearty as he has been. Mm. But they're just hitting him with everything that they can because they feel like he can stand. You know, I I think probably if uh, we're, I, I won't be alive, but fifty years from now they're people are going to look back on and say, you know, they used to put leeches on people and suck the blood out of them. And you know what else they used to do? They used to inject you with radioactive isotopes and just about half kill you as a treatment for cancer. And they say, yeah, they were, that's pretty primitive stuff. Because uh, what, you know, you can have cancer and actually feel normal. And then when they start treating you is when you really, really, really get sick. Well, Let's us pray for him. They're going to put a feeding tube in him and get some nourishing in him, nourishment in him. Uh, Betsy is uh, twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday going for uh, swallowing treatments, and they're trying to get her from using just a, a, a feeding tube to, um, to actually where she can eat some, not solid food, but at least some soft food. Kind of, you know, that's what their aim is right now. That's a, pray for her and Ned. They, they, that trip back and forth, that's a... 
twice a week, and that's a when Daddy started having to go to kidney dialysis, he, he said he came home one day. He said, well, he said, I figure I got me a new job. He said, that's, that's the way to look at this. He said, I go to work, and I'm down there. I only have to work four hours. He had to do that four days a week. Mm-hmm. And he says, I get off work, and I come home, and I get ready for the next day of work. He says, so it's like I've got a job. So instead of thinking he was being treated or having to go to the doctor or sit in a chair and have his blood filter, He's kind of a, he'd go clock in, he'd do his job, clock out. Because Daddy had uh, grown up on a farm, and he knew, what, you know, cutting wood and uh, chopping cotton and picking crops and things like that, hard work. So he said, this, this is just, this is like that. Uh, an old friend of the church, uh, Jimmy Hazel. Anything, you heard anything on Jimmy? He passed away. Yeah. We went to his funeral yesterday. I hadn't heard. Hadn't heard. Sorry. So yes, y'all remember the Hazels and Smallwood and all that friends. Uh, I, I, uh, Jimmy was not here when I became pastor, but uh, his his wife uh, passed away not long after we we came here, and they were they were a, a nice couple, and um, uh, their their daughter and my my daughter Carice went to school together, and. Um, but uh, I'm sorry that we had uh, the deacons uh, last Sunday. Deacons made a request prayer for Jimmy, and it said he was very near the gate. So let's pray for Jimmy's family. And uh, I'm sorry that I had not heard of about his passing. Um, continue to pray for Bonnie. Uh, they've got a, the twins have a birthday coming up this month, don't you? Yes. All right. Is she older than you? I am 10 minutes older than her. All right. Well, <laughs> so I'm the big brother. She's probably crowed about that her whole life. Oh, yeah. that you're the oldest. I have to. I don't know about it. <laughs> but you've probably tried to push that over on her, try to make her do oh, yeah. what she wanted her to do. Yeah. I uh, heard that Angela Cosby <laughs> wasn't doing too well. Last is she improving? She seems to be a little bit better, maybe. Okay. You mentioned that the Eskridges that had COVID-19, have they tested negative yet? Uh well, I talked to Rodney last Saturday, and they still haven't tested negative yet. Okay. Well, my daughter, they told her yesterday that she's got COVID. Ah. So she's not, you know, she they, they sent her home from work because they said the man that worked next to her had, had, had it, and... He was there, so when he said you were getting there, coughing and getting it, so they told her to just go home and not to come back until Monday. And then they checked that she had to run a test, and they said, yeah, she had it already. So hmm. What's her name, jo- Joanne? Nika. Say it again. Nika. Nika. N-I-A-K-A. Alexandria. <laughs> <laughs> Went from young to Alexandria. <laughs> okay, N- Nika, Alexandria. All right, well, I pray that uh, that will, will kind of work its course with her, uh, and she'll she'll recover from that. Um, of course, we can't go see her, and she can't go see us, right. so uh, they told her to keep her husband at home, too, that he didn't have no business going out in public, you know, being in with her. Mm-hmm. He could be having it and scattering it to other people, too, so... Uh, always keep Donna Serta in your prayers. Uh, always pray for Ann Sanders. Uh, pray for uh, Edna Whitman and uh, Evelyn Garrison. Uh, she may be Evelyn may be watching this morning, but uh, Karen's been having some health issues lately and uh, has been feeling poorly. So pray for uh, Karen Reeves. I saw a pretty picture of her and her newest grandbaby this week and uh, th- th- will they not let you hold the baby i hadn't i seen a picture of roger and sue and, and karen but ever so often i get to go over and get it when nobody's looking <laughs> uh, t- don't take a picture of you know, and i, I actually saw a pic- couple pictures of andrew and he had his oh yeah had papoose uh, sack <laughs> uh, going out to the park or something like that so, oh yeah man that, was, that, that is so yeah. nice i just rejoice with them uh but god bless the reeves family and and uh even, even uh, though Carolyn hadn't been feeling well, she had a smile on her face when we had that baby, and so did Sue. Billy Tom Blankenship is Henry and Linda's neighbor. I, I said he's been leaving, being acting uh, 
feeling poorly. I, I don't know how he's doing. Pray for James and Renee Owens, former members and friends of the church. Nair uh, Buell, Brian's mother, is in Brazil. Uh, she's my favorite Brazil nut. So she's uh, <laughs> that's where she's from, and she's down there see, with family. And uh, she, she'll, we'll have to teach her, teach her how to speak English all over again when she gets back. But uh, there are others for whom we've been praying. Certainly pray for those folks down in uh, Florida. They're kind of, I think uh, the storm is over now and the water's receding. But uh, a lot of lives are lost and uh, property damaged in the millions and millions of dollars. Is there someone else? Uh, you, uh, we put uh, Joan's daughter there. Anything that I, anybody that I've overlooked or forgotten? Uh, Danny and Liz, as I said, traveling. Pray for them. There may be others who uh, have an opportunity to be out and about. If you could continue to pray uh, uh, for, for me as I search for a car, and uh, it, uh, there are plenty of cars out there, but just trying to find one that uh, is the one the Lord wants me to uh, drive back and forth to work. So. Uh, there, I don't know who is watching this morning, but the, we have several regulars, a number of people who tune in with us. We're beginning the study of the book of Jonah this morning. So uh, we, uh, I, I get in a bad habit. I, I know many teachers and preachers do and says, this is my favorite book. You know, and depends on, uh, But I really liked Amos too. I liked Amos and we're now we're in the, uh, Jonah, starting Jonah. And I, uh, there was a family Bible that we had. It's funny, we never... Uh, I probably was the only one that ever opened it, and I was before I could read, but it had, had lots of uh, paintings in it of biblical stories from Adam and Eve on up, you know, through uh, the John the Revelator, and I had big, full-page, color, glossy photos of uh, what I didn't know were actually very, very famous paintings, uh, Rembrandts and uh, Gauguin's and... Uh, Famous painters who put, uh, painted the biblical scenes, uh, Albrecht Dürer and things like that. But uh, one of my favorite was uh, Jonah, either being swallowed up or spit out. Yeah, it was, was kind of a, it was a kind of picture that would appeal to a little boy. Saying, "Oh, big old fish and swallowing somebody." I don't want to hear that story again. My grandmother would tell us often she would ask for requests, not always. But uh, let's pray then, and uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. It's good to see you, and uh, let, we'll, uh, we'll open our Bibles. Some unique things, some things I've taught and preached through the book of Jonah several times, but I wanna, I'm approaching it, uh, the, just the introduction pretty much today. We know the story, and I'm going to kind of do a synopsis of that this morning, but uh, some thoughts about it that I don't think I've ever uh, formally shared as part of my preparation. So let's pray together. I always pray for uh, Henry and Linda Crow, and I pray for Larry Guthrie as he comes. He's going to be with us today. I'm looking forward to Bucket uh, sharing with us. We're going to dedicate our boxes and send them out, and uh, that's just some, some good good work there for all of you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the goodness and grace of being here in this place, especially with these people. We are representatives of family members friends, other members of our church. There will be others here later on. Lord, we're coming to seek your face and to receive a blessing and to be a blessing. Help us to sense your spirit and always be willing to do just exactly what he prompts us to do. Move us, lead us, and guide us. I trust that he will be our fire, our inspiration, our calling, our purpose teach us something today, not just to make us smarter or to know more about the Bible, but something that makes a difference in our life and perhaps even something that will make a difference in someone else's life. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, remember, I mentioned uh, the minor prophets are in no wise... Uh, minor because of their insignificance, but uh, the, the major prophets were like long books with lots of chapters. The minor prophets were very brief. The book of Jonah is only four chapters long. Jonah is also mentioned in uh, the book of, of Kings and Chronicles. It's just a passing <coughs> reference. It's just him as a prophet. Of course, he has a unique distinction <coughs> of also being referred to 
by Jesus. Uh, I put on my Facebook page last night that Jonah is more than just a fish story. People talking about the fish they caught. There's this big. Look at this big fish. Yeah, but what about the fish that caught Jonah? He was bigger. Yeah. God, I had heard about this, and I actually saw a, a news clip yesterday of some people. You know, um, when they have these big fishing tournaments, bass fishing tournaments, things like that, uh, they usually say it has to be at least uh, this long. And so they have a standard. You're, you're the fish that you enter into the contest. They, they come, people pay big uh, uh, fees to the win. So they say, well, it's got, if, if it's shorter than this, you got to throw it back and you can't enter that in. I think you get to enter two or three fish. But the rules are different on different contests. And then if it's a certain size, then they put them on a scale and weigh them. Well, huh? somebody stepped up on the stage, he had a pocket knife. And he took one of them fish and he spit it open. Guess what he found in there? Great old big lead balls in that mm -hmm. fish. Two or three of them just in his gullet. That yeah. poor old fish that said, here, come here. And they just put them, and that thing weighed, weighed a lot. Well, those fishermen like to went nuts. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> those guys started running for the hills. That, that seems like a pretty good idea until you get caught, I guess. But they're you know, probably involved thousand dollars, and then they don't tell them how many times. Probably somebody they had won several other contests, and somebody says, "You know what? That that bass was awful heavy." <laughs> somebody would slip up there with a, a frog gigging knife and just cut their belly open and out and rolled them big old round lead balls. Well, that's a fishing story. Uh, actually, the the Bible. Uh, in uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the translators translate the word for the creature as whale. And uh, atheists and naturalists love to crow about the fact that a, a whale's throat is only about that big around. A whale can't swallow much more than a bean or a peanut. So what they say, well, that's just obviously a false story. Sometimes I, when I read this to the Lord, I say, Lord, this is a really a great story. If you just left that fish out of there, this would be an even better story. But the thing about it is, is that people went, even many Christians, and perhaps even Jewish people, it's in their Bible, all in the entire known world that they know about Jonah is that he was swallowed by oil. They don't know anything else about the, from the Bible about it. And so sometimes when you've got this in the front, it kind of blasts everything else out of the water. But the Lord thought that it was amusing probably. He probably had a big time doing that. But the, uh, do you remember where, where Jesus makes reference to Jonah? Yeah, he said, as Jonas, Jonah, Jonas is Greek. As Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's right. That's right. That's the reference. Jesus obviously be, believed in Jonah and that he was in the, the whale three days and three nights. And he says, just like just like that. And uh, Jesus was telling his disciples, you know, when I die, I'm going to be in the grave three days. They did that. That didn't stick with them until later on. They began to say, you know, and he, he told us all about that. He mentioned that. That's exactly what he said he's going to do. I said, well, you know, I forgot about it. Uh, when tragedy strikes, it's amazing what all you can forget, what all goes past you. Don't ever be harsh or critical on someone if they're going through a terrible, stressful catastrophe, if they don't dot all the I's and cross all the T's. Oh, why didn't you do that? Or how could you forget that? You know, sometimes people say, why didn't you call me? Well, I, you know, I didn't think of you. I, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking of other things. Uh, I think in this world, we need to cut everybody a lot of slack. Just let a lot of things go and say, hey, you know, we don't need to worry about that. We, we need to let that go. Uh, there are people in the world and we do that sometimes ourselves. We, we probably slight people or been slighted or we've been neglected or forgotten. We've forgotten people. But uh, for the most part, those things just happen. Uh, I'm 
I thank God every day when my when I have some mental clarity and I'm able to think straight, put thoughts together. Um, I think that for all of us, you know, we, we all realize that there might come a time when, uh, you know, where our faculties don't work anymore. We can't figure stuff out. We don't know who we are or where we are. But they, uh, sometimes when we see people like that, sometimes they seem to be at peace. You know, they seem to be even happy if uh, to have the cares of this world have slipped away from them or uh, things, the problems of life are no longer in their mind. Maybe that's, I'm just trying to look at the uh, uh, silver line, uh, those kinds of things. But uh, here, uh, Jesus uh, said these things and then they were forgotten and then remembered. He had told them the Holy Spirit would help them remember those things. But the word that is translated, uh, you know, they, they were not botanists in those days and they're, they're especially uh, even the people that began making English translations. They just they translated a whale. If you find modern translations, they call it a sea creature or a uh, sometimes a sea monster or a huge uh, fish. Uh, we don't really, all we know it says the Lord prepared it. <laughs> so he probably fished his throat so he could swallow. Oh, I, yeah, you know, telling uh, you know, someone was, someone was making an argument in Sunday school, and one little egg-headed boy was making an argument about the way whales are, and they have little little bitty tiny fine teeth, and and, and things like that. And you couldn't live in the belly of, a, of anything for three days, and and uh, and then the teacher said, "Well, but it says that." God prepared the creature. And the little boy says, oh, well, if you're going to bring God into it, you know, <laughs> you do anything to win an argument, I guess. So, uh, and that's the whole point. It says God prepared a great fish, a great water, whatever. And, you know, it probably had a, a living room and a lamp and, uh, you know, an easy chair and a television and cable. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, uh, so here I am. Let me see. I spent about 10, 15 minutes talking about the fish, and it's, it's, I, it's the least important part of the whole story. So it, it kind of feel I have to do it. This is the story. God, God comes down to a Hebrew prophet, and I mentioned that Jonah is mentioned. He he has good credentials. He's like he's in the yellow pages, you know. He's uh he's in the phone book. He's he's a respectable kind of guy. And uh, faithful, and he he's just mentioned in passing in other Old Testament books, the prophet Jonah. He did this or said that. But God says here in chapter 1, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish so that he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now this is, this is astounding. And this book is not like any other book in the Old Testament. This is something that I don't, uh, I, over my life, I have not had many conversations with Jewish people. I love to hear Jewish people give who have accepted Jesus. I like to hear their testimony about how they accepted Jesus as their Messiah and how the God worked in their lives and how he saved them. And now, you know, what they thought about Jesus before they became a Christian, they thought he was like the Catholic God. And uh, that they really thought Jesus was like a statue on a cross. I had no idea. It was a, and he was probably a pope or something. I mean, who knew? And then they read uh, the New Testament, expecting it to be some kind of Roman or Christian, anti-Jewish thing. And they find out every page of the New Testament, it was written by Jews. 
And it's very, very, and I heard someone in a testimony that I listened to last night said, the New Testament is the most Jewish document or book I have ever read in my whole life. And he says, and I'm a, I've been a Jew for 60 years. Well, uh, there's one interesting thing in chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare thereof and went down into the ship. It, when he was running away from the Lord, he was always going down. Yeah, there's another down in verse 5. I've got those circled. Jonah was going down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Uh, yeah, going going down, sliding downhill. You know, there's a there's a, a very common Old Testament word that I used to hear in church revivals when I first became a Christian. Every time you went to revival, you knew that the, the firebrand preacher who came into town to preach revival was going to preach a sermon about backsliding. Yeah, going to be having a good backsliding sermon. That's when. The people of God go down. That's when they go away. That's when they slide backwards, when they lose ground. So here's Jonah's backsliding. And, uh, and I, he always had a good sermon on hell, a good one, a good sermon on heaven. And, uh, you know, the, the prodigal son was almost, a, he had a few that you could almost count on. That, you know, you're going to have a two week long revival. Lots of preaching. And a lot of it was, uh, I wonder when he's going to preach on hell this week. And uh, but anyway, that's right. Went down, down, down. Uh, then it said, the Lord sent out a great wind. Well, Nineveh was the capital city of the Babylonian Empire. And the Ninevites were cruel and atrocious. And they were, I mean, they, they you could say, the, the worst in the world. They would, you might say of them, they took no prisoners. We know the Babylonians, they'd go down there and round up all the uh, strong, healthy, gifted, talented people and kidnap them and take them home and make slaves out of them. They would make eunuchs out of all the men and uh, put all the young women in harems and uh, brothels and things like that. Just awful treatment. We saw back in the book of Amos that when God talk to those uh, cows or kind of Bashan he says you you, uh, you big rich fancy ladies he says they're going to lead you away to Babylon with hooks and that, that's a terrible thing that what they would do is get a long chain or rope and put fish hooks in it and put it in your jaw mm. put it in your jaw and close it up and just twist it and that works better than twist ties mm -hmm. uh, not many people run away the only way to run away is to leave part of your face behind. But they just put that, and they, that's how they lead you around. It's like a, putting a bridle in a horse's mouth. That, that sounds awful. They would chop people up and dismember people and, and skin people alive. This, uh, there are records that are outside the Bible that tell about, they, they, they were, they felt that what they really wanted to do was that when they surrounded a city, they just wanted the city to give up, but, you know. Uh, maybe if we just surrender, they'll they won't kill as many of us or hurt us or torture us. They kind of were counting on that fear and that reputation for cruelty. I don't know if that's the entire reason, but here God says, "Go cry against that great city Nineveh, for their wickedness is come up before me." Now, think about that. Think about. Uh, the, the world when God sent the flood of Noah so the, the, the world was wicked but there weren't any laws there was only one law there was only one law don't eat the forbidden fruit it was the only law there was yeah. you know when Cain killed Abel there was no law against murder uh, Cain was not really punished he was just kind of exiled he was sent out of town, sent away. Uh, Lamech said, well, I said, uh, Cain killed somebody, got away with it. He said, so I just went and killed two people. That's in Genesis chapter uh, 5. <laughs> Lamech says, well, uh, God didn't punish uh, Cain, so I just went and killed two people. He said, I just picked out two people I didn't like, and I'm going to kill them. 
it's not a law against it. The world was so wicked in God's eyes that he sent the flood. But there was no Ten Commandments. There was no thou shalt not kill. There was no laws against idolatry or adultery or stealing. There, there were no stop signs and no speed limit laws. There, there, were, there, was, there wasn't any prophets. There were not any preachers. There were not any... Um, this is a time when... You see, the image of God was created into man. And God knew that apart from laws and commandments and rules and regulations... We knew what was right and wrong. We had a moral sense that was a part of our very being. Uh, Paul says that we already knew what was right and wrong before God ever gave the law. He says the law just came in to condemn us. Yeah. So that's that's the proof. God says, well, that's what we're going to bring up in court. That's the proof. That's the that's the evidence. These Ninevites, they didn't have the Old Testament, the New Testament. They didn't. They maybe they had never even heard of God, unless they read something on the internet. You know, I don't know. They didn't. Uh, they didn't have the Ten Commandments. They didn't have any. They didn't know who Amos was or Isaiah or Ezekiel. No. And yet, God says, "Wickedness has come up before me." If we ever make our relationship with God about how many rules we're keeping or how many rules we've broken, we may be missing something. Well, the whole, the way I see it, the whole point to the law, people say the law of Moses, but I always say the law of God because God gave it to Moses. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is to my mind to tell people this is my standard and the best you are you cannot meet it and that's why the world needed Jesus to come in and be the ultimate sacrifice for the whole world but these people in Nineveh they didn't even have that standard they didn't have the law of God at all they didn't have it in any written form or preached and yet they were accountable to God. And this is this, uh, an argument that, that Paul makes in the book of Romans. He says, before, before the law was given, man still could, stood condemned because all he had sinned. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I meet people all the time who says, well, I, I've kept this commandment, this commandment, this commandment, this commandment. I remember back in, uh, on the laugh in back in the late 60s, there's a comedy show came on Monday night, Rowan and Martin's laugh in and that's where I, I met a lot of people who later became famous comedians. They kind of got their start there on Life In. One of them was Lily Tomlin. And she played a little girl that sat up in a great big old rocking chair. I don't know if you remember her. Edith Ann. Edith Ann. Edith Ann. She's, and that's the truth. <laughs> she, was, she was being punished. She was having to sit in that rocking chair. She couldn't get up and run and play. And she said, uh, my mama told me not to draw on the wall. She said, I didn't draw on the wall. And uh, she said, she told me not to uh, throw my toys on the floor. She said, I didn't throw my toys on the floor. She says, mama told me not to run in the house. I said, I didn't run in the house. But she didn't tell me not to shave the cat. <laughs> her mama didn't tell her not to shave the cat. So she thought that'd be perfect. That's what she's been punished for. You know, there are lots of things that don't have anything to do with laws that God said. You know, there are lots of things when I was growing up, my friends would say, hey, let's go do this. And I'd say, no, I'm not going to do that. My mom and dad would kill me if I did that. And they said, well, did they tell you not to? I said, no, but I, I'm, I'm, pretty sure what, what I, I, I'm pretty sure what my mom and dad like and what they don't like. And this has never come up. But this just looked like one of those things. I, I was... I was already, I, I don't think I ever just walked right into something that I didn't know was right or wrong. These people were wicked. Now, here, here's the big thing. I think that the Jewish people often, and, and they, I, they, they would be very, they would judge me very harshly knowing that I'm being critical of their whole religious take. 
is that they they understand, they think of themselves Jewish people, but the chosen people of God. God loves us more than anybody else. We're the special ones. God loves us. And of course, they that's they, many of them have doubted the, the truth of that. But remember, when God called Abraham, He says, "Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you and all of your children." And uh, and whoever blesses you, Abraham, I'm going to bless them. And whoever curses you, I'm going to curse them. And he says, through you, through your children and descendants, shall all the people of the world be blessed. That's something that I have never sensed in the writings or the teaching or in the culture of the Hebrew people, that their God always intended to bless everybody in the whole world through them. And that's what Jesus was battling when he came to earth. He was saying, you guys, you don't like the Samaritans. You won't touch the Gentiles. You don't. You believe that you're the people of God and nobody else is. He says, God never, he, when he called Abraham, he says, it's my intention to use you to bless. And Jesus he started with the Jewish nation. He started with the Hebrew people. And then he, he opened up. And then before he left, he says, go tell everybody. Go tell everybody. And it wasn't very long, wasn't very long, relatively speaking, before there were more Gentile Christians than there were Jewish Christians. But look at this. Here is a book in the Bible where God sent one of his prophets to a Gentile capital city. You say, well, God, what are, the, what are the Ninevites got to do with your plan? God says, I have everything to do. I don't just love Jewish people. I don't just love the people of Abraham. I said, I want to save everybody. I'm, and they didn't believe in God. God, as we found out in the book of Amos and other books too, God is, everybody's God. <laughs> Maybe someone worships Dagon or they worship Baal. God is their God. And uh, in the book of Amos, God says, I'm going to judge the Samaritans. I'm going to judge the people of Tyre. I'm going to pe judge uh, the, the people of Damascus because they are wicked. their wickedness has come up before me. Now, uh, Jonah went, he finally, we're going to get to, we're going to do all the fish stuff too, the, the whale stuff. But he goes to Nineveh and he, preaches to those people. He tells them God gives them the message. Addison asked me several months ago, said, Pops, how do you know? <clears throat> Where do you get your messages from? How do you know they come from God? I said, serious question. I said, well, I tried to explain it to her. And because uh, I really don't, I, I, I never have looked at any message of mine and said, well, I, I thought all that up or I figured all that out or I, I found all that. I never have. I said, well, I'm some, uh, most of the time when I'm getting up to preach, I'm saying, I wonder what I'm going to say. <laughs> I've done a lot of studying, and I've prayed a lot, and I've, I've prepared a lot. I wonder what I'm going to say. <coughs> and, and I almost always surprise myself, and I say things, well, I didn't know I was going to say that. And God speaks to me through me, because uh, I, I have to confess that uh, I'm not clever and uh, not even bright. And... Uh, Jonah had a message that God gave him and didn't have anything to do with becoming a Hebrew. He didn't say, all right, God's going to destroy y'all in 40 days if, if y'all are not circumcised. He didn't say that. He didn't mention circumcision. Y'all need to build a temple. No, Jonah didn't say that at all. Here's all the Hebrews over here, and they're supposed to go to the temple, and they're supposed to make sacrifices at the temple. And uh, he didn't. He didn't say go. What y'all need to do is kill a bunch of goats and bulls and cats, and if you do that, God won't destroy you. That wasn't Jonah's message at all. He didn't. Uh, he didn't say y'all need to be baptized. He didn't say that y'all need to start taking Sunday off. Y'all, y'all, if y'all take Sunday off, y'all are all going to hell. I heard the last week is amusing. There's a, a Jewish, a young lady who's a Jewish comedian. Her name is Ariel uh, Amos. And uh, 
she said she was born and raised in Kentucky. She said she was they were the only Jewish family she knew of in Kentucky. There were probably others, but she didn't know. And she said, <clears throat> a lot of people think when find out when her name is Ariel, they say, well, you're named after that Disney character. And she said, no, I'm named after the former prime minister of Israel. <laughs> and uh, she said, there her friends at school really, she was an oddball to them. And one of her friends came to her today, one day on the playground, and she said, those are just little kids. She said, her friend said, Earl? She said, that's what they call me. They, couldn't, they didn't know what an Ariel was. She said, Earl? So I'm real sorry, but we found out in Sunday school that since you're Jewish, you're going to hell. And she said, uh, and Ariel said, oh, you mean you think about me on the weekends? <laughs> she was just happy that somebody was thinking about her. Well, this is like a little New Testament gospel in the Old Testament. He said, this is just about you and God. This is about you and God. And God's coming for you. And the, the, the story says it, that they listened to Jonah's preaching. <coughs> he didn't tell them about the Ten Commandments. He didn't tell them about the law. He didn't mention any other prophets. He just said, God has looked down, and he hasn't compared you to some standard. He has said, I made you, and I know what you're capable of. And he says, you, you're just, you've are just you chosen to just be wicked. And even though those people didn't have a preacher or a prophet or a law officer or a policeman or a governor or a mayor, they didn't have the law of God, they knew in their hearts that what they were doing, the way they were living their lives, was wicked. Now, <clears throat> there are always, and there are people that fill our world today, and they they know they're wicked. They know they're wicked. They, they, they're calling evil good and good evil. And they are they are perverting truth, and they just think, oh, we'll just, we'll just do that. And God says, no. No, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that. There's, there's a consequence to that. Yeah, that's going to catch up with you. There's a payday. If you break God's moral or spiritual code, say nothing of having broken his commandments or broken his laws. There are people who are going to stand before God. Listen to this. This is what the Bible teaches, and this is what we know. There are people who are going to stand before God on Judgment Day. They've never heard of the Bible. They have never heard about God and they've never heard the gospel and they're going to be condemned. They're going to be judged guilty and condemned for eternity because they didn't respond to the light that they did have. They didn't respond to the light and God's going to judge them according to the light that they did have. And uh, everybody's not going to be judged the same. But there will be, the Bible says there. Paul in Romans chapter 1 says, what did he say, Randy? He said, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. No excuse. He says, you've seen the works of God. You've seen the creation of God. You've seen the, the world and all of its workings. He said, you can't stand up and say, oh, look, nobody ever told me. I never went to church. No, I didn't know. He said, no, it was evident. Paul says, it's obvious who God is and what he's like. And you will have, he says, no excuse. Well, <clears throat> This is strange. Uh, he didn't tell them. He, he could have went out through all of Nineveh and says, Don't eat pork. <laughs> they would say, What? What are we going to do at a barbecue? You know, you know they're Gentiles like us. Well, uh, when we look back at a lot of the things, God didn't have any intention to start a religion for the Jewish people. A lot of the laws were really just to get them alive through the wilderness. There were specific laws, and many of the laws and the commandments and the rules just simply have to do with the Jewish people and how God was going to get them to the promised land. Then all of those sacrificial guidelines, if they didn't apply directly to the coming Messiah, 
they have no meaning at all in my mind. And that's what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, oh, the blood of goats and oxen and calves, he says, never forgave a single sin. He says, they were just all pictures of the coming of Christ. So when Jonah was preaching, he was just saying, it's about you and God. It's about you and God. And he didn't, it wasn't about religion. It wasn't, wasn't about rules. It wasn't about regulations. God's coming for you. God's coming for you. Well, maybe we need to simplify our, People say, well, what do you feel about gay people? What do you feel about lesbian people? What do you feel, feel about transgender people? What do you feel about abortion? Where do, when does life begin? You know, maybe, maybe our message needs to be, God's coming for you. <laughs> God's coming for you. Well, what about, no, no, no. Uh, you know, I, I don't know the answers to all those questions. I can't yeah. solve all those problems. But I guarantee you, God's coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> and you better act accordingly. That that blood was Jonah's message. Yeah, but it was as simple as it could be. It, it, it didn't have any points. He just ran through and walked through the town. There was this one gimmick. He only had one gimmick. And this is what I believe was. I'll close with this. I've gone too long already. If Jonah was in a whale or in a, some kind of living creature for three days, when he got spit out, he was probably whiter than this paper right here. And he didn't have a hair on his body. He didn't have a hair on his body because those digestive juices and enzymes had bleached him out. Mm. There's this guy down there. He's on the shore, seashore. This big old bubbling water comes up and a big old monster comes up and goes, Bleh! and this guy gets spit out on the shore and he's naked and he's completely white as a shell and he don't have no hair. He stands up and he looks at the guy fishing there and he says, repent. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's that's going to make an impression on somebody. But he went all, you know, if you heard that guy walking up and down the streets, he's just saying, God's coming for us, man. And that's a weirdest looking guy. He's from he's from uh, Jerusalem and Judea. And, and he just says, God's coming for us. What do you think about that? He says, well, well, let's go hear him and let's go see him. Well, that's, at the beginning, Jonah was running away. Yeah. But when the whale spits him out, he starts running the town. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's, it's turned around completely, 360 degrees. It's an unusual story, and it may be the story that, that we need today. So look, I all these social issues, all these scriptural and biblical questions, I really don't have the answer to it. I just got Jonah's message. God is not happy, and the only thing that makes him happy is, is not you straightening up and flying right. It's a he sent Jesus, and you never, you better have Jesus. If you don't, God's coming for you, man, and he's the only, only thing God's looking for. All right, thank y'all for coming and being here. God bless y'all. Thank y'all for tuning in. Who are with us today?